This is the Cambridge Assessment International Education, Cambridge IGCSE, June 2019 examination in English as a Second Language. Paper 4. Listening. Welcome to the exam. In a moment, your teacher is going to give out the question papers. When you get your paper, fill in your name, centre number and candidate number on the front page. Do not talk to anyone during the exam. If you would like the recording to be louder or quieter, tell your teacher now. The recording will not be stopped while you are doing the exam. Teacher, please give out the question papers. And when all the candidates are ready to start the test, please turn the recording back on. Now you're all ready. Here is the exam. Exercise 1. You will hear four short recordings. Answer each question on the line provided. Write no more than three words or a number for each answer. You will hear each recording twice. Question 1. A. What does the man miss about his home country? B. When will he next go back there? With me today is Colin Peters, who has recently moved to the US. What was it like moving here? Well, I come from a cold country, so the heat of the southern US has been quite a shock, although not an unpleasant one. I contact my friends regularly on social media, but it's not the same as seeing them, and I wish they could move out here too. I'll be able to see them again early next year though, as I've got two months' work coming up in my own country then. The fact that my parents had already moved out here has really helped me to settle in though. With me today is Colin Peters, who has recently moved to the US. What was it like moving here? Well, I come from a cold country, so the heat of the southern US has been quite a shock, although not an unpleasant one. I contact my friends regularly on social media, but it's not the same as seeing them, and I wish they could move out here too. I'll be able to see them again early next year though, as I've got two months' work coming up in my own country then. The fact that my parents had already moved out here has really helped me to settle in though. Question 2. A. Why did the man arrive late at the dentist's? B. What time is his next appointment? Good morning. Hi, my name's Mr Jackson. I had an appointment for 9.15 but I'm very late. I set off in good time because I could see that the traffic was terrible, but I got lost when I was about halfway here. We had to let someone else have your appointment in the end, Mr Jackson. I'm afraid you'll have to make another one. Oh dear, um, I forgot my phone, so couldn't let you know I was going to be late. Would it be possible to come back after five o'clock today? Unfortunately, we've got nothing else until 10.30 tomorrow. Oh, that'll have to do then. Good morning. Hi, my name's Mr Jackson. I had an appointment for 9.15, but I'm very late. I set off in good time because I could see that the traffic was terrible, but I got lost when I was about halfway here. We had to let someone else have your appointment in the end, Mr Jackson. I'm afraid you'll have to make another one. Oh dear, um, I forgot my phone, so couldn't let you know I was going to be late. Would it be possible to come back after five o'clock today? Unfortunately, we've got nothing else until 10.30 tomorrow. Oh, that'll have to do then. Question 3. A. What has the woman spent the morning doing? B. Where does she want to meet her friend? Hi, it's Selina. I was just calling to see if you're still free for lunch today. You know how I usually run round cleaning the house on a Sunday morning while my husband does the cooking? Well, 
Because the kids are on holiday from school, their dad's taking them camping, which has given me time for some gardening. I haven't had the chance to do that for ages. Anyway, it would have been lovely to meet at the cafe, but it's closed today, I'm afraid. So how about going to the pizza restaurant instead? I could see you there in about an hour, if that's okay with you. Let me know. Hi, it's Selina. I was just calling to see if you're still free for lunch today. You know how I usually run round cleaning the house on a Sunday morning while my husband does the cooking? Well, because the kids are on holiday from school, their dad's taking them camping, which has given me time for some gardening. I haven't had the chance to do that for ages. Anyway, it would have been lovely to meet at the cafe, but it's closed today, I'm afraid. So how about going to the pizza restaurant instead? I could see you there in about an hour, if that's okay with you. Let me know. Question 4. A. What is the woman organising a celebration for? B. Where is she hoping to have the celebration? Hi, Judy. How are you? Well, thanks. A bit busy, though. Oh, have you got a lot of work on at the moment? I have, but I'm trying to organise a party at the same time. Have you and Roger got a big wedding anniversary coming up? We have in a few months. Twenty-five years. But next month it's my son's graduation, so I have to arrange something for that first. Are you having the party at home? I'd really like to, but it's not big enough for all of his friends, so I've been looking into holding it in a hotel instead. That sounds wonderful. Well, good luck. Hi, Judy. How are you? Well, thanks. A bit busy, though. Oh, have you got a lot of work on at the moment? I have, but I'm trying to organise a party at the same time. Have you and Roger got a big wedding anniversary coming up? We have in a few months. Twenty-five years. But next month it's my son's graduation, so I have to arrange something for that first. Are you having the party at home? I'd really like to, but it's not big enough for all of his friends, so I've been looking into holding it in a hotel instead. That sounds wonderful. Well, good luck. That is the end of the four short recordings. In a moment you will hear exercise two. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Exercise 2. You will hear a young businesswoman called Alem talking to students about setting up a business. Listen to the talk and complete the details below. Write one or two words only in each gap. You will hear the talk twice. Hi everyone. It's nice to be here. Just two years ago I was a business student like you and now I have my own successful business. So how did I manage it? Well, that's what I'm here to talk about today. Just after leaving university with my business degree, I decided that it hadn't included enough practical information about setting up your own business. That's when I saw an advert for the Starting a Business course. I decided to try it, and that's how I ended up doing the 10-week course at City College, just after graduating from Central University. Unlike the lecturers on my degree course at university, who were academics and knew a lot about the theory of business, the teachers on this one used to be company owners, so they knew about the practical side of running a business. Although the course contained lots of information that really increased my knowledge of business startups, what ended up proving even more significant was the confidence it gave me. Without this, I don't think I would have been ready to start. I made some interesting contacts too, a lot of whom I'm still in touch with now. I had lots of ideas for businesses I could open. One of these was to open a shop. I love 1960s clothes, so wondered about buying and selling these. In the end, 
there didn't seem to be a big market, so I went for my second option of importing and exporting furniture. I'm glad I did, because it's been pretty successful, and I've always had an interest in that sort of thing. I had enough money saved to get going, but needed another bank account. All banks ask for a business plan, so I had to sort that out before they'd let me open an account. I just used some websites to help me with it, and in fact, the internet has been a superb source of advice and information since then. There are so many people who've been through the same thing who are willing to help. I was never that good at maths, so I thought I'd struggle with working out the finances of the business, but it's amazing the difference having a good accountant can make. The advertising gives me the most problems, though, as I have to arrange it in so many different countries and languages. It's obviously working, as I'm probably going to have to employ more staff to help me soon. Lots of friends have advised me to leave this city and move to the capital, as there are obviously more customers there. But I'm going to ignore them and just get bigger offices here when something becomes available. So my advice to anyone who's thinking about setting up a business is to try and pay no attention to how frightened you feel. It's completely normal. And rather than work continuously in those initial weeks and months, as many people are tempted to do, stay calm. Running a business can be so stressful. Now you will hear the talk again. Hi everyone. It's nice to be here. Just two years ago I was a business student like you, and now I have my own successful business. So how did I manage it? Well, that's what I'm here to talk about today. Just after leaving university with my business degree, I decided that it hadn't included enough practical information about setting up your own business. That's when I saw an advert for the Starting a Business course. I decided to try it, and that's how I ended up doing the 10-week course at City College, just after graduating from Central University. Unlike the lecturers on my degree course at university, who were academics and knew a lot about the theory of business, the teachers on this one used to be company owners, so they knew about the practical side of running a business. Although the course contained lots of information that really increased my knowledge of business startups, what ended up proving even more significant was the confidence it gave me. Without this, I don't think I would have been ready to start. I made some interesting contacts too, a lot of whom I'm still in touch with now. I had lots of ideas for businesses I could open. One of these was to open a shop. I love 1960s clothes so wondered about buying and selling these. In the end, there didn't seem to be a big market, so I went for my second option of importing and exporting furniture. I'm glad I did, because it's been pretty successful, and I've always had an interest in that sort of thing. I had enough money saved to get going, but needed another bank account. All banks ask for a business plan, so I had to sort that out before they'd let me open an account. I just used some websites to help me with it, and in fact, the internet has been a superb source of advice and information since then. There are so many people who've been through the same thing who are willing to help. I was never that good at maths, so I thought I'd struggle with working out the finances of the business, but it's amazing the difference having a good accountant can make. The advertising gives me the most problems, though, as I have to arrange it in so many different countries and languages. It's obviously working, as I'm probably going to have to employ more staff to help me soon. Lots of friends have advised me to leave this city and move to the capital, as there are obviously more customers there. But I'm going to ignore them and just get bigger offices here when something becomes available. So my advice to anyone who's thinking about setting up a business is to try and pay no attention to how frightened you feel. It's completely normal. 
And rather than work continuously in those initial weeks and months, as many people are tempted to do, stay calm. Running a business can be so stressful. That is the end of the talk. In a moment you will hear exercise 3. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Exercise 3. You will hear six people talking about what makes them laugh. For each of speakers 1 to 6, choose from the list, A to G, which opinion each speaker expresses. Write the letter in the appropriate box. Use each letter only once. There is one extra letter which you do not need to use. You will hear the recordings twice. Speaker 1. I often watch comedy programs with my parents. It's the one type of program we all love to see. We watch online, so fortunately there's plenty to choose from these days. This usually means we take turns selecting what to watch, so we get to see a variety of programs. Mom and Dad often choose something that they used to watch when they were younger, and although I hate to admit it, I do tend to laugh more at their choices, even though mine are much more up to date. Speaker 2 Comedy is definitely my favourite type of film. My friends and I go out together to see a funny film most weekends. Talking about it afterwards is almost as funny as watching the film. I also love finding videos online that give me ideas for surprising my friends and family when they're least expecting it. One time I gave my little brother an ice cream that was actually made out of potato. He laughed immediately because he realised what I'd done. That kind of thing makes us laugh more than anything. Speaker 3 When my family goes to the cinema to see a funny film together, my mum and dad often laugh at stuff that I don't even understand. And then in parts of the film I find really amusing, they're completely silent. Maybe it's because they're much older than me, but then the same thing seems to happen when I'm with my friends too. I've tried explaining why I'm laughing to them, but they never understand. I suppose it means that, between us, we find more parts of the film funny. Speaker 4 I sometimes feel left out when I'm with my friends, because a lot of what they laugh about comes from programs and videos they've seen online. They tell me that I've got to watch them because they're so funny, but I'd rather spend my time looking for things that I know I'll definitely enjoy. I think the best kind of comedy doesn't use words at all. The characters just do silly things that end up with them getting covered in food or mud. I could watch that all day. Speaker 5 My dad's a real expert at telling the same joke again and again. Maybe he just forgets that he's told it before, but he can't understand why we don't think it's funny anymore. Going to the movies is like that as well these days. The films all use the same tired jokes with different actors and expect everyone to laugh. It's odd, 
because there are plenty of genuinely different and funny programs that my friends and I watch on the internet. But this originality doesn't seem to happen in films. Speaker 6 I'd really like to be a comedian when I'm older. I'm not sure what my parents think, but there's nothing I like more than making a big group of people laugh. It's certainly not as easy as it looks. I occasionally try out some of my jokes on my friends, but they don't always laugh as much as I'd like. They tell me about things they've seen online that I can watch to get ideas from, though, and a lot of what they suggest is really amusing. Now you will hear the six speakers again. Speaker 1 I often watch comedy programs with my parents. It's the one type of program we all love to see. We watch online, so fortunately there's plenty to choose from these days. This usually means we take turns selecting what to watch, so we get to see a variety of programs. Mom and Dad often choose something that they used to watch when they were younger, and although I hate to admit it, I do tend to laugh more at their choices, even though mine are much more up to date. Speaker 2 Comedy is definitely my favourite type of film. My friends and I go out together to see a funny film most weekends. Talking about it afterwards is almost as funny as watching the film. I also love finding videos online that give me ideas for surprising my friends and family when they're least expecting it. One time I gave my little brother an ice cream that was actually made out of potato. He laughed immediately because he realised what I'd done. That kind of thing makes us laugh more than anything. Speaker 3 When my family goes to the cinema to see a funny film together, my mum and dad often laugh at stuff that I don't even understand. And then in parts of the film I find really amusing, they're completely silent. Maybe it's because they're much older than me, but then the same thing seems to happen when I'm with my friends too. I've tried explaining why I'm laughing to them, but they never understand. I suppose it means that, between us, we find more parts of the film funny. Speaker 4 I sometimes feel left out when I'm with my friends, because a lot of what they laugh about comes from programs and videos they've seen online. They tell me that I've got to watch them because they're so funny, but I'd rather spend my time looking for things that I know I'll definitely enjoy. I think the best kind of comedy doesn't use words at all. The characters just do silly things that end up with them getting covered in food or mud. I could watch that all day. Speaker 5 My dad's a real expert at telling the same joke again and again. Maybe he just forgets that he's told it before, but he can't understand why we don't think it's funny anymore. Going to the movies is like that as well these days. The films all use the same tired jokes with different actors and expect everyone to laugh. It's odd, because there are plenty of genuinely different and funny programmes that my friends and I watch on the internet. But this originality doesn't seem to happen in films. Speaker 6 I'd really like to be a comedian when I'm older. I'm not sure what my parents think, but there's nothing I like more than making a big group of people laugh. It's certainly not as easy as it looks. I occasionally try out some of my jokes on my friends, but they don't always laugh as much as I'd like. They tell me about things they've seen online that I can watch to get ideas from, though, and a lot of what they suggest is really amusing.
That is the end of exercise 3. In a moment you will hear exercise 4. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Exercise 4 You will hear an interview with a woman called Lisa Holonova, who is a choreographer, which means she creates dance routines. Listen to the interview and look at the questions. For each question, choose the correct answer, A, B or C, and put a tick in the appropriate box. You will hear the interview twice. Thanks for talking to us today, Lisa. You're what's called a choreographer, someone who creates dance routines for people to perform. What's your favourite part of the job? My job involves deciding which steps individual dancers should do and then building this up into a whole dance routine. And I love every minute of what I do. I get to teach and work with some of the most talented dancers in the world. To hear them say that I have inspired them makes me feel very proud. Almost as much, in fact, as seeing all my hard work come to life on stage in front of an audience. It's far more rewarding than any award I've ever received. And is there anything that can be difficult about your job? I work with dancers who are still in high school, dancers on concert tours, and on TV shows too. This gives a wonderful variety. But handling the different demands and personalities of the performers can cause tension from time to time. Some choreographers find knowing how to do lots of different types of dance quite difficult and prefer to specialize in one type only. What's a normal week like for a choreographer? This job has moments when there's far too much work and you're running from one job to the next, followed by times when you're wondering if any more work will ever arrive. It's hard to call any working week in this job typical. You have to learn to welcome the unexpected and make the most of the quieter times when they happen because they don't usually last long. Is there one essential characteristic that every choreographer should have? Good question. I firmly believe that anyone in this line of work needs to be passionate about whatever they are doing. It's this that will make a show or routine successful even if you're struggling to make it really original. Personally, I think my biggest strength is my positive attitude, but I've seen quite a few very successful choreographers who are the complete opposite. How much money do choreographers generally make? While you're gaining experience, you'll sometimes need to do things for free. Although it makes earning a living pretty tough, it'll get your name known and then the paid work should start to come in. Even then, as a relatively new choreographer, you'll probably be put on the lowest pay scale until you've become a little more well-known in the industry. I'm earning roughly 10 times more now than when I took my first paid work. How much time off do you get? I try not to take time off at all if I have a big job on. However, there are sometimes gaps between jobs, and that's when I get the opportunity to catch up with the people I love. A lot of my contracts are in other cities and countries. I enjoy visiting new places, but I do have moments when I say to myself, it's good to be home. Is there anything people should do before they start trying to get work in your profession? Although no formal qualifications are necessary for becoming a choreographer, I'd strongly suggest that you learn with as many different teachers and choreographers as possible. In this way, you'll experience lots of different approaches to dance. Seeing many dance shows can be interesting too, though you never actually know how the choreographers have created them. You just see the final product. So your career has gone very much as you intended? I'm not sure if that's how I'd describe it, as the work I've wanted has appeared exactly when I've needed it, rather than according to some grand plan. For sure, I've worked hard, but it's never really seemed like it because I love what I do so much. Thank you so much, Lisa.
Now you will hear the interview again. Thanks for talking to us today, Lisa. You're what's called a choreographer, someone who creates dance routines for people to perform. What's your favorite part of the job? My job involves deciding which steps individual dancers should do and then building this up into a whole dance routine. And I love every minute of what I do. I get to teach and work with some of the most talented dancers in the world. To hear them say that I have inspired them makes me feel very proud. Almost as much, in fact, as seeing all my hard work come to life on stage in front of an audience. It's far more rewarding than any award I've ever received. And is there anything that can be difficult about your job? I work with dancers who are still in high school, dancers on concert tours, and on TV shows too. This gives a wonderful variety, but handling the different demands and personalities of the performers can cause tension from time to time. Some choreographers find knowing how to do lots of different types of dance quite difficult and prefer to specialize in one type only. What's a normal week like for a choreographer? This job has moments when there's far too much work and you're running from one job to the next, followed by times when you're wondering if any more work will ever arrive. It's hard to call any working week in this job typical. You have to learn to welcome the unexpected and make the most of the quieter times when they happen because they don't usually last long. Is there one essential characteristic that every choreographer should have? Good question. I firmly believe that anyone in this line of work needs to be passionate about whatever they are doing. It's this that will make a show or routine successful, even if you're struggling to make it really original. Personally, I think my biggest strength is my positive attitude, but I've seen quite a few very successful choreographers who are the complete opposite. How much money do choreographers generally make? While you're gaining experience, you'll sometimes need to do things for free. Although it makes earning a living pretty tough, it'll get your name known and then the paid work should start to come in. Even then, as a relatively new choreographer, you'll probably be put on the lowest pay scale until you've become a little more well-known in the industry. I'm earning roughly 10 times more now than when I took my first paid work. How much time off do you get? I try not to take time off at all if I have a big job on. However, there are sometimes gaps between jobs, and that's when I get the opportunity to catch up with the people I love. A lot of my contracts are in other cities and countries. I enjoy visiting new places, but I do have moments when I say to myself, it's good to be home. Is there anything people should do before they start trying to get work in your profession? Although no formal qualifications are necessary for becoming a choreographer, I'd strongly suggest that you learn with as many different teachers and choreographers as possible. In this way, you'll experience lots of different approaches to dance. Seeing many dance shows can be interesting too, though you never actually know how the choreographers have created them. You just see the final product. So your career has gone very much as you intended. I'm not sure if that's how I'd describe it, as the work I've wanted has appeared exactly when I've needed it, rather than according to some grand plan. For sure, I've worked hard, but it's never really seemed like it because I love what I do so much. Thank you so much, Lisa. That is the end of the interview. In a moment you will hear exercise 5. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam.
Exercise 5, Part A You will hear a woman giving a talk about Charles Babbage, who was a 19th century mathematician and designer. Listen to the talk and complete the notes in Part A. Write one or two words only in each gap. You will hear the talk twice. Hello everyone. I've been invited here as part of your History Week to talk about someone who's often referred to as the father of computing, Charles Babbage. His early inventions known as calculating machines are among the most celebrated icons in the history of computers. Charles Babbage was born on December the 26th, 1791. From an early age, Babbage showed a great love of mathematics and even taught himself all about algebra. On entering Cambridge University, he found his mathematical skills to be far more advanced even than those of his tutors. They still taught only classical mathematics, whereas he had already read the innovative work of many European mathematicians. After graduating from Cambridge, Babbage worked as a mathematician, and it was at this time that he first acquired his interest in the calculating machines that became his great passion for the remainder of his life. Although he's perhaps best known for a machine called the analytical engine, a machine that could perform not just one mathematical task but any kind of calculation, he'd already developed the difference engine, his earliest design. It was only partially constructed by Babbage, but could still be successfully used to produce mathematical tables, like those used by students today. Georg Scheutz, a Swedish inventor, successfully constructed another machine based on Babbage's designs in 1854. With this, he was able to create tables which were put to a variety of uses, especially by navigators. Planets were also accurately mapped thanks to this early technology. It was used by both the British and American governments. When much older and into middle age, Babbage also played a role in the establishment and reorganization of many important scientific institutions. Through these, he attempted to put pressure on the British government to provide more finance for scientific work and on the media to raise public awareness of science through publicity. Interest in Babbage's work did not disappear after he died. In 1985, the Science Museum in London began construction of a calculating machine that Babbage had developed using his original designs. It was completed and working by 1991, just in time for the 200th anniversary of Babbage's birth, and consists of 4,000 parts weighing over 3 metric tons. A printer for this machine was completed in the year 2000. It has a similar number of parts and weighs 2.5 tons. Now you will hear the talk again. Hello everyone. I've been invited here as part of your History Week to talk about someone who's often referred to as the father of computing, Charles Babbage. His early inventions known as calculating machines are among the most celebrated icons in the history of computers. Charles Babbage was born on December the 26th, 1791. From an early age, Babbage showed a great love of mathematics and even taught himself all about algebra. On entering Cambridge University, he found his mathematical skills to be far more advanced even than those of his tutors. They still taught only classical mathematics, whereas he had already read the innovative work of many European mathematicians. After graduating from Cambridge, Babbage worked as a mathematician, and it was at this time that he first acquired his interest in the calculating machines that became his great passion for the remainder of his life. Although he's perhaps best known for a machine called the analytical engine, a machine that could perform not just one mathematical task but any kind of calculation, he'd already developed the difference engine, his earliest design. It was only partially constructed by Babbage, but could still be successfully used to produce mathematical tables, like those used by students today. Georg Scheutz, a Swedish inventor, 
successfully constructed another machine based on Babbage's designs in 1854. With this, he was able to create tables which were put to a variety of uses, especially by navigators. Planets were also accurately mapped thanks to this early technology. It was used by both the British and American governments. When much older and into middle age, Babbage also played a role in the establishment and reorganization of many important scientific institutions. Through these, he attempted to put pressure on the British government to provide more finance for scientific work, and on the media to raise public awareness of science through publicity. Interest in Babbage's work did not disappear after he died. In 1985, the Science Museum in London began construction of a calculating machine that Babbage had developed, using his original designs. It was completed and working by 1991, just in time for the 200th anniversary of Babbage's birth, and consists of 4,000 parts weighing over 3 metric tons. A printer for this machine was completed in the year 2000. It has a similar number of parts and weighs 2.5 tons. Part B. Now listen to a conversation between two students about John Atanasoff, who invented the first electronic computer, and complete the sentences in Part B. Write one or two words in each gap. You will hear the conversation twice. That was a really interesting talk about Babbage's early machines, and a good way of introducing our presentation on John Atanasoff. Yes, and like Babbage, Atanasov was a genius, so I think the first part of the presentation should be about his education. Good idea. So, I found out that his parents were keen for John to do well academically, and his mother in particular supported his love of mathematics. Yes, he concentrated on science and maths at high school too, as at that time he wanted to study physics at university. Though the university near where he lived in the US didn't offer this course, so he ended up doing electrical engineering instead, which was probably a good thing in the end. It was. While he was studying for his doctorate, and even after he had started working at Iowa State College, he often thought about how to create a computer. That's right. The calculating machines he used for his work just weren't good enough, so he was constantly doing experiments to try and improve them. And did you know, he found that driving helped his creativity, and it was after doing this one night that all his thoughts somehow came together, and he knew he had the solution. We must put that part in the presentation. Also the fact that Atanasov worked on his ideas with one of his students, Clifford Berry, and between them they created the world's first digital computer in 1939. That's right, and although the Atanasov Berry computer, as it became known, was very different to today's devices in that it was designed for a single function to solve systems of linear equations. It offered vast improvements in speed over previous calculators. That's right, because unlike Babbage's machines, the controls were electronic rather than mechanical, though the way it did calculations wasn't as reliable as they'd have liked it to be. True, but this was a pretty minor problem when you think about the complexity and slowness of using the machines that scientists had been forced to work with up until then. And compared to other early computers that appeared shortly afterwards, it was relatively small. That's right. Some of those filled a whole room. Even so, it still took up a similar amount of space to a desk, which is not the sort of thing you'd want to carry around in your rucksack. <laughs> Definitely not. Now you will hear the conversation again. That was a really interesting talk about Babbage's early machines, 
and a good way of introducing our presentation on John Atanasov. Yes, and like Babbage, Atanasov was a genius, so I think the first part of the presentation should be about his education. Good idea. So, I found out that his parents were keen for John to do well academically, and his mother in particular supported his love of mathematics. Yes, he concentrated on science and maths at high school too, as at that time he wanted to study physics at university. Though the university near where he lived in the US didn't offer this course, so he ended up doing electrical engineering instead, which was probably a good thing in the end. It was. While he was studying for his doctorate, and even after he had started working at Iowa State College, he often thought about how to create a computer. That's right. The calculating machines he used for his work just weren't good enough, so he was constantly doing experiments to try and improve them. And did you know, he found that driving helped his creativity, and it was after doing this one night that all his thoughts somehow came together, and he knew he had the solution. We must put that part in the presentation. Also the fact that Atanasov worked on his ideas with one of his students, Clifford Berry, and between them they created the world's first digital computer in 1939. That's right, and although the Atanasov Berry computer, as it became known, was very different to today's devices, in that it was designed for a single function to solve systems of linear equations, it offered vast improvements in speed over previous calculators. That's right, because unlike Babbage's machines, the controls were electronic rather than mechanical, though the way it did calculations wasn't as reliable as they'd have liked it to be. True, but this was a pretty minor problem when you think about the complexity and slowness of using the machines that scientists had been forced to work with up until then. And compared to other early computers that appeared shortly afterwards, it was relatively small. That's right. Some of those filled a whole room. Even so, it still took up a similar amount of space to a desk, which is not the sort of thing you'd want to carry around in your rucksack. <laughs> Definitely not. That is the end of exercise 5, and of the exam. In a moment, your teacher will collect your papers. Please check that you have written your name, centre number and candidate number on the front of your question paper. Remember, you must not talk until all the papers have been collected. Teacher, please collect all the papers.